Good afternoon, folks. Um, as I say, my name is Steve Chadwick, and I'll be with you for the next sort of hour or so. Uh, in terms of about probably 45, 50 minutes or so in terms of the update for Standards 2021. Um, and then we'll have a, a formal Q&A at the end. Now, that's not to say not to raise questions as we go along, because you're very welcome to do that. Um, what we've also got, um, Zoom is not a new platform, but it's a new platform for us as a webinar broadcasting team. So uh, yeah, a bit more functionality here than maybe uh, what you've seen before. Uh, if you were part of our webinar sessions in the height of lockdown 1.0, I think we can call it now, you'd be a bit familiar with a different platform. But again, Zoom, quite familiar to many of us, and we're using that now for our session today. Okay, so as I mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, in terms of raising those questions, if you could use the Q&A option, that will help, that will help um, no end quite simply, because it'll allow my colleague Giles and Nigel to actually just get a little bit of order, a little bit of stacking of the questions there. We can see what we've answered and what we haven't. So um, that would be much appreciated. Um, one or two thoughts just coming into the chat box, which is fine. Um, it's just, as I say, what we can do from here with that Q&A panel, that'll help us a lot going down the line. Um, okay, so what we'll do from here is just get ourselves going. I'll uh, hide my face from myself. There's nothing quite the same as actually watching yourself talking. So, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us on this webinar, focusing on the updates that's going to be seen in NHBC Standards 2021. Digital release of that is already out there. So the NHBC website is already showing and hosting through our Standards Plus functionality the NHBC Standards 2021. So as you mentioned, the session will be around 45, 50 minutes of broadcast from me. Um, I'm gonna be ably supported today uh, by two of the key members of the Standards Innovation and Research Team. That's in the shape of Senior Technical Officer, Nigel Shapland, and Standards and Technical Manager, Giles Wilson. They're gonna be collating the questions as we go along. So uh, again, it may be that we have a deluge of questions. And again, those guys are only so good and there's only a couple of them. So we'll do our very best to get through the questions as best we can. If we find after our, even our Q and A session at the end, we've still got a few outstanding, we will make sure to come back to you. But as I say, we're just uh, interested to see how things go. Because in terms of uh, folks in the session now, we've got what, 320 and rising. So uh, again, could have a few queries off the back of all those uh, persons in the room. Okay, so what we've got from here, looking at this, I mean, historically, we would typically mention, you know, I'm based at home, we work from home. It's a bit more of the norm now, isn't it, really? We're a long way past this being a unique situation as it was back in March. So um, anyway, sometimes you get additional challenges as a result of that. But as I say, we're all a bit more familiar with those now. So the Q&A box, I've gone on about that enough. Let's use that as our focus. It'll give... Again, uh, Giles and Nigel, half a chance to sort of get a bit of order to those, which ones we've answered and which ones we haven't. So uh, thank you for that ahead of it happening. Just from a housekeeping perspective, as you've logged in, whether it's through a, a smaller device, a smartphone or something, or a tablet, or even up to a laptop, you should have some options of clicking on the Q&A, that will pick up the box and you can pop a question in from there. Um, sound and various other things will be as per your device will allow. So, um, okay, basically from there on in, what we're gonna have a look at is the updates in terms of 2021 uh, taking our way through today. Now, there is a wider program of webinars that we're working on at the moment. Uh, again, we've got a session later on in the month that does look at some of the amendments that are gonna take place um, from approved document B. Um, but the focus of our attention today is gonna to be looking at NHBC standards 2021. Okay. So thank you for your patience so far. Now, as a few headlines, just to get us going. So at the highest possible level, areas that have been changed and subject to a full review are on the left-hand side. So updates to chapter 6.1, 7.1 and 10.2. I talk about those as though everybody knows precisely what they are. Lots of you will, because I can see a lot of uh, colleagues in the room, but not everybody knows what 6.1 relates to. But 6.1 is external masonry walls. 7.1 is flat roofs, terraces, balconies. Again, that's been an amendment in terms of its title now as well. Uh, and chapter 10.2, 
which relates to uh, externals as far as uh, drives landscaping etc is concerned now minor revisions we'll touch on those at the end of the session so uh, could be here in a good few minutes explaining which chapters they relate to but we'll come back to those later on in the day but 6.1 so again this is back to external masonry walls so a task group was established to review the chapter comprising be it um, manufacturers trade associations and builders uh, the chapter needed updating rather than a radical change a few sort of uh, amendments here reference to up-to-date british standards and so on so that's sort of what it went through that I've got a shorter review on that at the end of the session now chapter 7.1 this is the biggie this is the one that's essentially been rewritten so it has been subjected to a complete review and a rewrite um, so there's been an update so the assistance again of the task group made up of members from the flat roofing industry including manufacturers and contractors uh, related trade bodies, be it organisations, and an HPC technical staff as well. So the title of the chapter has been changed from flat roofs and balconies to now go a little bit wider to flat roofs, terraces and balconies, uh, reflect the extended scope of the chapter, which now includes terraces and podiums. The podiums were referred to in chapter 5.4, so uh, structures that may require waterproofing, but there's a closer correlation there amongst the, some other things. So chapter 10.2, main changes to this chapter, basically just bringing it up to date, replacing some of the old British standard references that were made in there. Looking also with the harmonized EN standards as well. Particular reference is being made to the highway work specification now. That's been updated and we're looking at sub-base thicknesses and some of the finer points in that. Now, several de definitions have been added to all three of these chapters actually that have undergone a review, just so we know what we're talking about. Also, uh, updates in terms of table detailing, um, looking at limitations and looking at a few other few other things too. So as you said, the minor revisions will appear and we'll, go, we'll come back to those a bit later on in the day. Okay, so chapter 7.1. So this is what's been un undergone such a, a large review. So we thought we'd give it the um, top billing and we'll have a look at this one first of all. Okay. So regulation and what to expect. So what is expected from the industry? Well, to comply with NHPC standards, you must meet that technical requirement. One of the ways of doing that is to follow the guidance in chapter 7.1 for flat roofs, terraces and balconies. Also of interest and particular interest is uh, British standards of BS 8579, which has also been updated this year. Referred to, and this is referred to within the compliance section of chapter 7.1. A little bit more on that in a minute. Okay, so the updated standard. Definitions, again, you can't pick these out. It was, uh, I thought of many ways of trying to make this visible on screen, but it's a bit difficult. So this is just a representation really. So definitions has been expanded um, to extend some key phraseology from the chapter. So we've got mention in here of private terrace, raised podiums, buried podiums as well. Um, also then looking a little bit more at the designer, to act as that common liaison from maybe the below ground structure to above ground. Also much clearer references. I suppose it's back really, as far as the standards book is concerned to chapter 5.4. So there's always been that correlation, but a much more clearer relationship now. So again, sometimes we'll find design and build issues that fall between the cracks, so to speak. So either with several designers or installers, whether it be the roofer, specialist ground worker or waterproofing specialist. Okay, of particular note, when it comes to compliance, the list of other sources of information has increased dramatically from what was last year's edition. I think they numbered maybe five or six entries. There must be sort of well over 20 now. Just acknowledging that in reality, the, the breadth of this particular area is, is quite huge. So to pick on one particular resource, we mentioned it just a few moments ago, we're looking at the rewrite of BS 8579. Now 8579, as a sort of the scope of it, and this has been taken from the, the BS itself, gives guidance on the design of balconies and terraces and their component parts. It mentions that balconies and terraces covered within it can be at any height above the lowest ground level, unless otherwise stated. Now the British standard goes on to define Juliet guardings, but covers their guarding elements only. 
Now, certain aspects of the British standard are not applicable to walkways, roofs, pedestrian surfaces and balconies intended for access only for maintenance. These include enclosures of balconies, arrangements of balconies, wind effects, uh, inclusive design, safety, ventilation outlets and acoustic design. So again, just as a bit of a taster as to what the scope of that British standard was referring to. Okay, as the chapter's undergone an extensive review, the changes start on pretty much page one. So mention is made in this section, so 7.1.3, uh, one of the very early clauses, we're looking at deflection analysis for medium to large roofs, more on that a little bit later. Methods of ventilation, just alluded to that in terms of it being mentioned in the British standard as well. Specification for intensive and extensive green roofs now extends to biodiverse roofs and blue roofs. Survey requirement, preparation treatment of the deck before application of waterproofing. We'll touch on that again a little bit later as well, but sometimes solutions that are used to aid the curing of that concrete deck can have a, a poor interaction with then what the waterproofing cover is going to be. And finally, methods of testing the integrity of that waterproofing layer. So a few things there as well. Okay, so individual elements. The design elements clause has clearly been extended to include terraces now to align the chapter uh, with the, again with the title change, but it's changed significantly from previous editions. On screen, we've got an extract of some of the diagrams that have been added. It was acknowledged that the chapter wasn't adequately reflecting what was being commonly used, and therefore alternative guidance was being sought, which could have been leading to a misalignment of design advice. We've also gone on to identify more clearly what's meant by the terms of warm roof, cold roof, or inverted warm roof. Looking at toppings as well, just a bit more information, there's just a little bit more to it now. So again, clause 7.1.4, again, just drilling into those individual elements, highlighting what's meant by toppings. Further illustrations, just looking at how those component parts come together. So illustrated examples. So we've got an uninsulated deck with this one on screen just now. Warm roof construction. Inverted warm roof construction as well. As I said, just the headlines today really, again, quite a bit on chapter 7.1, but just the headlines today really. The ordering, again, drainage has been brought quite a long way forward from where it used to be in chapter 7.1. It's just to highlight the significance, bring to prominence the significance of drainage. So again, uh, drainage includes guidance on the use interpretation of zero fall roofs, just a little bit on that a bit later. How to maintain effective drainage on the completed waterproofing layer. New guidance has been introduced on the drainage of small balconies and terraces, which follows closely the advice given in that recently published BS 8579, and that relates to balconies. So design falls um, in a few areas here, nothing dramatically new, but just a bit more clarity. So a much more clearer distinction between design falls and minimum finish falls. So clause 7.1.5, table two, we've got that on screen just now looks to set out what they should be. So typically a design fall of one in 40 will match many of the expectations set out in table two. Not all of them as the more vigilant of you will see, but many. And similarly, a finished fall of one in 80 will typically match many of the expectations set out in the table. And these are very much in line with BS 8579 issued a little bit earlier on this year. The deck survey, mentioned about that a few minutes ago. So prior to laying the waterproof layers, a site survey of the deck should be carried out by the deck erector and any backfall should be addressed. Depending on the deck material, this may be achieved by applying a localized screed to remove the depressions and create falls to outlets. The adjusted areas should be resurveyed to ensure that no backfalls remain or by providing additional rainwater outlets at those points of maximum deflection. So a formal handover procedure should be undertaken between the deck erector 
and the waterproofing contractor. Timber structures and deck. So again, they will still feature. So in this case, timber structures should be in accordance with BSEN 1995-1-1. So appropriate load or span tables published by Trada in support of building regulations. Be regularized timber. So dry graded to BS4978 and mark dry or KD where softwood is used internally. Have iJoyce or metal web joists specified in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations and not use where any part of the joist is exposed to external conditions. Additionally, have joists which are sized and spaced in accordance with the design at a maximum sensors of 600 millimeters. Be level when necessary using hard packing such as tiles or slates bedded into the mortar to adjust those joists. Now loose or soft packing including timber should not be used in those settings. And lastly, just for this one, timber decks should be formed from one of the materials listed in tables three, four and five. And that's what I've picked out on screen. Now, deck materials now include those suitable for fully supported traditional hard metal roof coverings, such as zinc, copper, aluminium, and stainless steel. So concrete decks. So concrete flat roofs should be constructed to ensure they achieve the required design, strength, and durability, and be in accordance with BSEN 1992-1-1, and chapter 3.1 of NHPC standards, that's concrete and its reinforcement. So in situ, reinforcement concrete decks should be formed using a mix which has a low shrinkage characteristic, have accurately constructed and suitably supported formwork, have even surface to receive the selected waterproofing layer. Now with adhesive bonded membranes, the surface should be slightly roughened, wood floated or lightly brushed in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. Be protected until adequately cured and dried. Not contain additives that in themselves could affect the adhesion of any adhesive bonded waterproof and membrane. We spoke about that just a moment ago. And further confirmation if it was needed, that liquid supplied surface treatments onto the concrete to assist curing can adversely affect the bonding of the waterproofing layer. The compatibility of such liquids should be checked with the waterproofing layers manufacturer before use. So again, further expansion of some areas that did exist if only talked talked about in previous editions. So the section on profile metal decks has been expanded to cover profiled self supporting metal decks, supporting warm and inverted warm roof toppings. A new section, so a new clause has been added here around profiled self-supporting metal roofing, covering site assembly, insulated uh, com composite panels, pump teeth in, including standing seam systems. So I've got an example of that on screen at the moment, and factory insulated panels. So we look again, as far as in-depth guidance is concerned. So a little bit more here than we've provided previously. So thermal insulation and vapor control. So in this section, again, we also go on to mention about waterproofing layers and surface treatments has been revised to include some of the more commonly used materials. Now in the round common practice doesn't always relate to good practice, but it was acknowledged that again, we, didn't in, we weren't looking enough at some of the more commonly used materials other than say traditional bitumen membranes. So fully supported flat sheet, hard metal roof, waterproofing designs has been included for the first time. We've got illustrations in there as well on the preferred approach when using such waterproofing systems. Now, just to add a little bit of clarity, we've got uninsulated roof, so a bit more information here. So the temperature of the deck in this situation is at or close to that of the interior or exterior of the building, whichever is the lesser. A cold roof, the temperature of the deck is at or close to that of the external climate. So cold roof designs should be limited to roofs where it can be shown that effective cross ventilation can be provided. We're looking to reduce the risk of interstitial condensation in that example. Now warm roofs, temperature of the deck is at or close to that of the building interior. 
an inverted warm roof. I mentioned that a few times already. So the temperature of the deck is at or close to that of the building interior. So where we're then looking at that water flow reduction layer should be designed and installed to collect the drain, uh, sorry, collect and drain most of the rainwater to reduce water entering and cooling that insulation layer. So that's again, another factor just to allow to settle for a moment. Now condensation analysis should be calculated using an external temperature of minus five degrees Celsius. And this is in accordance with BS 6229. Just that confirmation of a visual example, really, as we were saying. Mentioned zero falls towards the start of our session. A question's come in uh, again to the panelists, I think from uh, one of my colleagues, just uh, looking at who that was there. And hopefully um, Giles and Nigel have been able to have a quick look at that one for us. Lightest of touch here, really, for this. Again, we'll look to expand this uh, maybe in the future in terms of other presentations, maybe. But one thing we all know and with experience within construction is that deflection will occur. It's going to happen. For example, timber frame, uh, especially, it's going to be through the occurrence of differential movement. And within concrete, again, as it shrinks, as the concrete actually ends, uh, continues to cure. A lot of this, so a very high proportion of that deflection, that change, can happen within that first couple of months. So six to eight weeks or so. Certainly need analysis when working with zero falls to um, basically to make sure we're gonna have, if we've got depressions, we've got deflection areas, as we're showing on screen, that either they're known, so we can see it here. If outlets can be placed in those depressions, great. But again, at least if they're directed into locations where that can be of least long-term effect. Okay. So I wouldn't quite say the joys of modern technology, um, but a building that's not too far away from uh, NHBC offices, uh, prominent structure uh, in and around that local area. You can see just from this image, uh, again, taken from Google Maps, other providers are available. Um, we can see several locations where we've got standing water. Um, if it wasn't clear before, I'm sure it is now. And we can see how, as I say, deflection has occurred in those locations and we've got standing water on the roof there. So the waterproofing layer and surface treatments, I alluded to these just a moment ago. But an update here as well, we've got that added in a little bit of a broader, um, I suppose sort of run with what we've got mentioned in those waterproofing layers now than we had in the past. We then look to take that just a, a little hop forward it's so a fully supported flat sheet, hard metal roof. So waterproofing design has been included for the first time, as we mentioned earlier, and illustrations will actually also match with this as well. Ventilation, mentioned that just a moment ago, particularly when we've got cold roof design, um, but is still of importance when we've got that warm roof as well. But ventilation needs to be effective and it should be in accordance with BS 5250 and BS 5 sorry, BS6229, with a minimum 50 millimetres ventilated void with a continuous 25 millimetres edge ventilation gap and a maximum five millimetres between ventilation points in the direction of the joists. With the verge to cross verge ventilation, the ventilation in the direction of the joists and five to 10 millimetres between ventilation points, a ventilation gap a minimum of 100 millimetres and continuous edge ventilation gaps of 60 millimetres is recommended. Intermediate ventilators are ineffective in reducing these ventilation distances. Ventilation also helps from a protective uh, patina on the underside of the aluminium, galvanised steel and zinc. So timber sarking boards with a three to five millimetre gaps are preferred as a deck option. If plywood is used, it should have a three to five millimeter gap between the boards. Integrity testing. So something else for us to think about. The waterproofing layer should be inspected for defects after installation. Any defects are to be repaired and retested and left in a satisfactory condition. Waterproofing layers 
on a flat roof, terraces and balconies greater than 50 meters squared or roofs which are difficult to access, such as buildings over three stories, should be subject to visual inspection and an appropriate integrity test undertaken by a suitably qualified surveyor. Waterproofing layers under 50 meters squared or those unsuitable for electronic testing, for example, EPDM or four-faced uh, bitumen membranes, may be checked visually, but should include inspection of any seams uh, with a suitable probe. Now, guidance on electronic test methods and their application can be found on the Roofing and Waterproofing Test Association's website. A test report containing the test results and photographic record of the roof should be made available to NHBC. Okay, just checking the question panel there if there's anything particularly that has shouted out. Again, the guys are doing a good job at filled in the queries there. Okay. Surface protection. So provided to a waterproofing layer must satisfy the fire protection requirements as set out in the national building regulations. Account must be taken of the waterproofing detail at abutments with a building and the extent that the waterproofing can be dressed up the wall of the building and the jointing detail between the roof waterproofing and the cavity trays or DPCs. This may include the use of non-combustible trays in the external wall of that building. Now extensive green roof systems should include non-combustible perimeter abutment strips to the building roof lights, etc., and at regular intervals across the roof in accordance with the guidance in the GRO, Fire Risk Guidance Document and National Building Regulations. I mentioned earlier uh, an expansion of certainly one or two of the clauses in this chapter. And here's, a, here's one of the examples. So further guidance has been introduced into this section. So it's now described as being green and biodiverse roofs, so brown roofs, as we've got mentioned here, including roof gardens. So also taken into account both warm and inverted warm green roof buildups. So where the roof, the green roof topping particularly is provided by the waterproofing layer manufacturer or contractor, the needs for a formal handover between the waterproofing system contractor and the green roof contractor has been included together with a written confirmation of compatibility on the two systems being used together. Pausing there on purpose, because again, there's quite a few things in there to think about. I'll quickly recap that one. So where the green roof topping is not provided by the waterproofing layer manufacturer or contractor, the need for a formal handover between the waterproofing system contractor and the green roof contractor has been included with a written confirmation of compatibility on the two systems being used together. Clause has been added around blue roofs, introduced for the first time with an emphasis on the need to have an effect, uh, effective water flow reduction layer. Pardon me. Um, what we're looking at there is just taking that uh, as a bit of a recap. So emphasis, needs to have an effect on the water flow reduction layer and the effect of water penetration on the thermal insulation value when using an inverted warm roof design over a warm roof design. Now, raised podiums um, have featured in NHBC standards for a little while now and be certainly seen in chapter 5.4. They are mentioned as well now in chapter 7.1. So clause 7.1.15, a new section incorporating podiums, as we've mentioned, looking to differentiate raised podiums, which are dealt with under this chapter, 7.1, and buried podiums, which are dealt with under chapter 5.4. That's waterproofing of basements and other below ground structures. The hope here is it's a much more joined up thinking and much more joined up approach to make it clearer for who is responsible for what. So illustrations added. Um, again, we've had a few detailed uh, drawings within chapter 7.1 for some years now. But in 7.1.16, it's been refreshed. A new one's been added, this one in particular. Uh, on an inverted warm roof, there should be two levels of water drainage, namely one above the insulation and one below the insulation on the top side of that waterproofing layer. I'll leave that there just for another moment. T 
taking us on a little way now, just into um, parapets and guarding. So finally, for what are the updates under 7.1 at least anyway, or some of them uh, in that case, guarding. So expanded to include illustrations and text on the design of copings and waterproofing to the parapet walls and examples on how to fix balustrading posts through the waterproofing layers without causing leakage through that waterproofing. I'll leave that one to land for a moment as well. Handrails, so handrail fixings or man safe systems. Um, what we've got here just on screen at the moment, so an NHPC detail, um, but we've got there the cap sitting on top of the membrane, linking in with the fixing points. In this particular case, um, we've got uh, some options there. Make sure I'm clicking the right button. Okay, so we've got a proprietary option just quickly on screen in the photograph there. Now, I sort of alluded a few seconds ago that we were coming to the end of the 7.1 update, not quite correct. Incorporating more, more content on balconies as well. So um, we'll take ourselves into that section just now. So we're gonna have a look at the risks posed by balconies. So we see lots of different types of balconies being produced. So whether it's bolt-on, cantilevered, Juliet's, I think as we alluded to before, more guarding than necessarily balconies, but there are others out there. Now, BS8579, as I issued a little bit earlier on this year, goes on to comment that balconies, terraces and access de decks should be designed to provide amenity for the building users and should be sized appropriately for their intended use. Balconies form a significant feature on the facade of many buildings, very often forming part of the character of the building. High quality design is therefore important to maintain the quality of cities and building stock. Design can be separated into two aspects, aesthetic and functional. So that's what BS8579 had to say about it. We'll move on from there. So a little bit of history, a little bit of background from NHPC's perspective. So referring back into a, an older edition of a technical extra, uh, that was number 22 issued back in April 17 made particular reference to in 2015-16 and HBC's expenditure on balcony repairs certainly was in excess of four million pounds. That trend has continued um, and at this particular point we're also found that there were a few around 100 cases each year. So low numbers of cases but a high amount of cost incurred by that. So in order to improve the picture and maintain upon those it was important that chapter 7.1 was looked at and it has now undergone that extensive review. So ultimately, we take account a few of the highlight points on screen. So looking into those repairs, going back to that little bit of a claims log, the extract there. So corrosion, decay and rot was a factor, waterproofing, poor detailing, drainage, and as built details were not necessarily, not in accordance with an HBC guidance. So all contributing factors, um, but what we need to make sure of particularly is that we've got good functionality. So we move on from there just a little. We look at compliance. I alluded to this earlier on. Other sources of information include, no, I'm not going to run up and uh, go through all of these. As I mentioned earlier, there are quite a large number of these now, making references to wider additional guidance. Lots of BS is pretty standards even referred to here now. Um, we've got, again, some industry-led papers as well. Now, as we mentioned before, a previous edition just made reference to just five. I haven't counted them intimately, but we must have the best part of 20 or so here. So a lot more guidance now. Put that provision of information. We're looking in relation to balconies. So as we mentioned at the start of the session, the provision of information that we require is much more extensive now. And we require a survey and preparation treatment of the deck before the application of the waterproofing and details uh, and fixing methods of balcony supports and guarding components to mention just a few. So looking at the balcony itself then, number of different ways to construct and fix the balconies to the structure. So only a real high level comment at this point for today. But what we're looking at is we'll bring in just a few images. Structural engineer design, manufacturer's guidelines must be followed. Whether we've got cast in situ or whether we've got a, you know, a so-called retrofitted solution, 
Any deviation in location, application, sequence, torque strength, etc., needs to be appraised by a suitably qualified engineer and the manufacturer. So only a very high level touch as far as this is concerned today. We need to take some account as well of thermal characteristics. So where we've got bolt on or cantilever type balcony detailing, thermal impact is definitely there. So an example on screen, just showing um, again, where we've got a break, so a thermal break on a cantilever balcony. So we need to also take account of fire safety, cavity barriers, steel frame, for the balcony is gonna be fixed back to that RC frame structure. So just as a side note, um, again, these uh, the fixings here have been sprayed, which typically indicates they've been tightened to a, a given and um, stated torque setting. So still in the realms of thermal bridging, so just a light touch as far as today is concerned, is we're taking account of the balconies provide a fantastic opportunity for heat to leave the dwelling. Fantastic, maybe not the greatest choice of words there, but it's an opportunity for heat to leave the property. You can see from the thermal images that we've got shown. So again, where heat is being lost, represented in the red, orange um, part of the spectrum there, or closest to the building. So for balconies, typically caused by the concrete or the steel support system bridging that external fabric. So looking into part L1A, so one of the approved documents, we look to insulate the dwellings to really high standards and make them airtight. These cold spots act as a massive draw for heat loss and heat loss in itself will have an impact on that energy rating calculation using the SAP method. There's other occasions where thermal bridging occurs, which is treated slightly differently. Uh, a wall tie would provide a repeated heat loss in an external wall, but this is included in the U-value can calculation. So we don't need to focus on that. Balconies, however, are considered to be a non-repeated thermal bridge, and these are included in the Y value. So all thermal bridges, which are non-repeated, are included within the Y value, including party wall junctions. And quite a lot of detail there in terms of the, the SAP method and the, the calculation method behind the energy rate in there, but only a light touch for today. Now the Y value comprises two things. The heat loss through that junction terms as the psi value and their linear length at that junction. So the extent of it, basically. So the, the psi value can be sourced from different places. It will be dependent on how the balcony is attached to the external wall and the type of thermal break that is used. Thermal breaks are often plastic based materials which present, uh, sorry, prevent even conduction of heat to pass through. With balconies, this is typically through steel. Okay. So a few different things for us to think about there, uh, as I say, taken into account by the energy rating assessor, uh, and just some finer details on thermal bridging. Now, again, um, in terms of being able to see those, these are just examples of where we've taken some manufacturer's information, taken the best use of that. Okay. Still looking at thermal bridging. So here's an example of a linear thermal bridge. And this one's from Shook. Other manufacturers are available. There are, of course, many other examples on the market, as I've just alluded to. But in all scenarios, the manufacturer's guidance must be sought and followed. And remember, linear joints must not span between two compartments. So we've had a look at the construction, very light touch today of the balcony. So let's have a look at how we can look to keep the water out. So examples. Some of you more familiar with uh, the makeup of NHBC standards will have seen an addition of this uh, illustration for many years. A bit more information on it this time though. Um, we've sort of taken a little bit more time to look at some of the critical areas, areas that we've seen have been um, maybe subject to some claims in the past. So accessible thresholds and upstands has been amended to include insulated upstands and a clause added on not using waterproofing membrane as DPCs under load bearing walls and the avoidance of forming hidden upstands within inaccessible cavities in cavity walls. We're looking then in terms of insulation layers. So we just captured from the standards again. So accessible thresholds and upstands. I'll bring the next one through in just a second. 
So what we're looking to do here, we were talking about design falls, we were talking about finished falls here as well. So this takes into account quite a few different things in here also. So a lot of detail on here, difficult to convey in a session like this, to be fair. But as I say, the standards plus uh, aspect of the NHBC website um, has got the 2021 standards loaded into them now. So uh, by all means, take a chance to have a look at those uh, as you can beyond this session. So to highlight just a few things, um, we'll bring that one forward to the accessible threshold. So of particular interest, what we've got um, just into here, we've got a dimension here, so minimum 30 millimeter drip from the face of the upstand. Now, uh, previous editions of this drawing didn't show that as insulated, but again, we've added that in just now. So a few things to think about there. Okay, so we mentioned previously, um, 7.1.5 relates to drainage now. So much earlier on in the chapter, much more of a focus of attention now in design terms and in terms of the installation as well. Now, as we said before, so drainage, balconies are by no means ex exempt from that. And the fact that the balcony, if it's enclosed on all or some of its sites, drainage is critical to maintain the integrity of the balcony and the building that it's attached to. Now, drainage requirements include an explanation when edge drainage to small balconies and terraces may be acceptable. And guidance is given, again, within the relevant British standard. So we talked about this earlier, so 8579 in particular focus. Uh, does give some good guidance relating to drainage opportunities for balconies. Okay, so guarding, taking that on just a little bit further, a little bit more has been added into this section. So the principles towards guarding are actually the same, whether it be external, like we see uh, in this particular photo, um, or when the whole balcony even is made up of solely of guarding. So Juliet, for example. There's been a, um, an over-focus on whether Juliet is a balcony, certainly an example of guarding, but again, we all know what we're talking about when we refer to that. But in fact, if there's a risk of falling more than 600 millimetres anywhere within the curtilage of the property, guarding is required where there is regular access. So with a small caveat, when maintenance only is involved. So a reminder there as much as anything. So again, taken from the standards once more, Guarding must be minimum height of uh, 1100 millimeters, not ex easily climbable. So where it's glass, so it'll be turf and glass, laminated glass box where glazed balustrading is used. Not to be fixed through the waterproofing membrane unless suitable precautions are taken. And that the balustrading is, has centers of no more than 100 millimeters. So again, extracts there, elements of the approved documents in there as well. Now, detailing on parapets, um, just hopping forward there a little bit. So 7.1.18 goes on to mention around strength, movement, and waterproofing. Now, particular note, we've got, takes us to this particular detail, this example. So references around this uh, have been mentioned already. So copings should project a minimum of 45 millimeters beyond the face of the wall below and incorporate a drip feature that discharge water at least 30 millimeters away from the face of the wall and stops water running back under that coping. So preformed edge trims that are sealed to and form a finished edge to the waterproofing layer and which extend down over the wall or fascia may have a lesser drip projection provided the waterproofing layer drains away from the trim. So important thing to take on there. Okay, just another diagram drawn from the examples uh, from the updates in 7.1. I'm making just one or two screen adjustments here, bear with me. Okay, so just a few more things to look at. Again, as I say, in terms of our uh, intended duration, a few more things to cover than that we first, in, uh, first expected. But balustrading and guardrails. So should be of adequate durability and fixed securely. The structures of which the balustrading and guardrails are fixed to should be adequately, sorry, should be adequate to safely resist 
the potential forces acting on the guardian. So it should not be fixed through the coping or capping due to the difficulties in achieving a waterproofing junction within that coping or capping and maintaining an imperforated DPC beneath the coping or capping. Easy for me to say. These issues should be avoided by fixing the balustrading to the face of the wall below the coping or capping. So diagrams or illustrations on screen just identify some of those examples. So fix through the waterproofing layer unless suitable precautions are taken to provide a waterproof junction. So for example, locating base plates on a raised waterproof curb or surrounding the base plate in what's been described as a pitch pocket detail, so top left, which you can see on screen at the moment. So there's that pitch pocket again, and there's a, an example of it in situ where we've got that raise, we've got that build up and that makeup, keeping the underlying waterproofing layer as far away from those mechanical fixings as we reasonably can. Okay, so just a couple of other visuals there of one or two of the things we've talked about in the last few moments. Okay, so we mentioned in other news, um, not making too light of it, but a couple of other chapters were subjected to quite a su substantial review. The outcomes weren't quite as substantial as, as was maybe first forecast. So uh, again, we've sort of left them a little bit further down the session today, conscious of the time we've got just at the moment. So chapter 6.1, external masonry walls and chapter 10.2 drives pathways and landscaping were also subjected to that type of review now it was found what we we're looking at so the objectives of the review for chapter 6.1 were to ensure key messages are clear remove unnecessary information a look at cavity trays review and update the section to make the guidance clearer mortar updated guidance to reduce the potential failures check and update guidance on fire stopping, update cross-references within the chapter. We've been making cross-references within the standards for a good few years now, but it's much more deliberate within the main body of the standard section now, so within the clauses, where there is a cross-reference over into other parts of the standards book. So what we, what we determined that following the, the inclusion of that task group, that actually we were finding that the chapter needed updating rather than a radical change. So some of what's been described as editorial changes have been made, um, but also looking to reflect current standards and practices used on site. OK, so let's just have a look at a few of those. It'll only be a fairly high level review on these. OK, so provision of information, what we're looking to take more account of um, in real terms is the setting out dimensions. So these should be masonry coordinating dimensions position of whether it be cavity barriers or the passive fire stopping required fire resistance periods should be specified 6.1.3 so structural design a little bit of a heads up on there as well so additional requirement added around uh, damp proof course or dpc compliance standards updated as well so uh, reference to pd 6697 lateral restraint has also been added to a little bit more information there as well we're added further um, updates sort of, for example, so air rated concrete has been updated to air create. So a few things that we've been meaning to do for a little while now. Now movement joints, reference to calcium silicate bricks has been removed. Again, the use in the UK is so low that was the option was taken to remove that. And a tidy up just in terms of the clarification of guidance on movement joints, looking at suitable materials and then the centers for those as well. So still in chapter uh, 6.1, we're looking at fire resistance. So again, more guidance there on um, uh, and looking to improve compliance. Acoustic resistance, more deliberate references to re the robust details. We've done that for a little while now, but more deliberate references there also. When we're looking at exposure, so exposure maps have been looked at and refreshed. One or two bits of information that were there. So we had some tables once upon a time making reference to postcode areas. They've been taken out, um, but we're looking at a bit more site specific information now. Um, rain penetration, wind driven rain, again, all still feature. So thermal insulation also been updated to reflect what is more commonly used good practice and uh, current products that are on the market there as well. 
So you can get a sense. We've made a few some small changes in a number of the clauses within chapter 6.1. So it's, uh, standard references updated, uh, looking at reference around sulfite attack below ground for concrete blocks. Bricks, as I, guess, as I mentioned, calcium silicate bricks, uh, that, that reference has been removed now. Stone masonry, teased out of being referred to in lots of other clauses, but again, more guidance on stone masonry now due to its increased use. Construction, so 6.1.11 um, makes specific references now to chapter 9.1, which is our consistent approach to finishes. It's always been there and alluded to, but it's it's made as a very clear and a very precise comment now. Also mentioned, we're around um, lintels. So if I just hop onto the, uh, sorry, I've gone on a little bit too quick there. Hop on to a couple of other areas, so lintels, so additional guidance given in terms of separate lintels now. So not just the combined options. Mortar, we talked about that. So modified tables to reflect what are mortar classes that have been uh, made reference to in BSEN 1996. Render, more intimate cross-reference back to chapter 6.11, which is our um, chapter specifically focused on render. Cladding, again, you can see this theme. We're looking back to chapter 6.9, so a specific standards chapter relating to curtain walling and cladding. So a much more of a, I suppose, a holistic approach um, in the commentary within the clauses now. As I hopped onto a little too quickly a few seconds ago. Um, yeah, so one or two of these images, um, I'm going to say carefully old favourites, but I've certainly seen them in the standards editions for many, many years now. But just a little bit more guidance in some of the areas. Um, so DPCs and cavity trays, so a little bit more information there now as well. Parapet detailing, example on the right there. So looking now for copings to comply with BS 5642. So additional drawings to show different materials used in the coping to improve that clarity. So a little bit more of expansion now. So wall ties. Again, so we've really given this one a good looking over. A lot of the guidance it was thought to be of in at a, at a good level, but just a reiteration and a reminding of all party members. And I just mean simply in terms of design teams, technical teams, we're looking then through specialist installers, looking through in terms of build teams as well. So um, lots more information there. And then finally, looking uh, a little bit of a, a refresh, not a massive update, just around what is described now as the protection of the works during construction, previously described as cold weather working. So we've got new requirements in there. So precautions shall be taken to protect walls from damage during construction. Issues to be considered is not just cold weather working, it's hot weather working and excessive rain. I think, uh, again, if this sort of recent phase of times and era and weather has taught us anything is that we could, we're at risk of all those different ones. So cold, hot and excessive rain as well. Okay, bit of a hair's run through chapter 6.1 there, but they are some of the headline adjustments changes within that chapter. 10.2 was also looked at. Now the main changes to this chapter are bringing it up to date and replacing the old British standards references. I alluded to that at the start of the session. Harmonized um, EN standards as well. References are now more clearly made to highway works. Specifications also been updated together with the clauses on the sub-base thickness. Definitions, there's a few more of these now within this particular chapter. So added at the beginning of the chapter to make it a little easier to understand the tables detailing pavement construction, providing clarity on the limitations of flexible retaining walls. And again, looking to sort of incorporate more up-to-date guidance is also provided for garden areas and timber decking. Okay, so Quickest of highlights, last few things now. Thank you for your patience so far. Um, as I say, lots of questions have been coming through as we've gone along. Um, still got 383 of you still here. I think that peaked the other side of 390 at one point. So thank you for your patience. Um, okay, so chapter 2.1, those who know the NHPC standards inside out will know that that is where we make reference to our technical requirements. So a little bit of an update in there. R3, the materials requirement, it's uh, referencing the MMC has been removed. We then look at uh, clause 6.3.7. So we're looking at um, revised sound insulation requirements for rooms containing a WC and new guidance for the insulation of soil pipes in floor voids and soil and vent pipes. That's internal walls. 
So we're looking here in terms of uh, chimneys and flues. So damp penetration and waterproofing now makes reference to a DPC tray. We've then moving on to 6.4. So we're looking at um, floors. Uh, so table three, support of the joist. So reduction in end support. We've then got 6.10. We made reference about this before. So we're looking at um, a clarification here for the protection against corrosion. So we've got stop breeds and things in focus in this particular area for render. 7.2.6, testing my knowledge of what our, each of our standards <laughs> chapters are. Um, but yes, so pitch roofs in this example. So added requirement for proprietary straps to meet the requirement of R3. This is back to the materials requirement and installed in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. And lastly, chapter 7.2.20, changing the codes of reference to the color codes which are used in BSEN 12588. So quite a few small adjustments there, just looking in other chapters. So bringing us towards the end of our session there, these are the areas we were going to focus on. The significant updates in the chapters were found in 6.1, 7.1 and 10.2. Chapter 7.1 has undergone an almost complete rewrite, so that's been uh, very much the focus of attention for today. We made reference, I made reference, to uh, several other areas where minor revisions have been undertaken. So as a quick review, 6.1, so the task group looked to establish and review the chapter comprising uh, and how it read. So now again, it was acknowledged it was needed to be updated rather than radical changes. And it's looking to reflect current standards, and just to reiterate this across the teams. Chapter 7.1, as I mentioned at the start, this is the biggie. This is really going to un almost under undertaken a complete rewrite. There's aspects from the previous edition but a lot of new material in there. In chapter 10.2, um, again, main changes to this chapter are bringing it up to date, replacing some of the old British standards references and references within the harmonized EN standards as well. So, okay, a few, quite a few, lots of different things there. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, that pretty much brings us to the end of our session today. So we're just going to enter into the formal Q&A now. I've got quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I suspect many of you will take your leave now. So thank you for your patience so far. Hopefully, if you can hang with us just a little bit longer, we'll have a look at those questions. Um, I think, again, Giles and Nigel have been doing a sterling job working through those. Now, hopefully, as I said, this has been of interest. Keep an eye out for new content in terms of webinars. So look at nhbc.co.uk search for webinars. As I said, not quite as many by number as there was in the height of the previous lockdown. But again, I think we've got a little bit more access to a few more things this time. So we'll keep that up to date. So keep an eye on that. And uh, thank you for attending today. And uh, if I can just check in terms of populations, yeah, we've got quite a few folks who've uh, had to sort of go on and have a look at what else they're doing. But thank you for your attendance today. I'm going to just come off um, video and also off mic now just for a little just for a short while see if Nigel and uh, Giles need any further help for me but otherwise to that thank you very much indeed appreciate your attendance